I think I like Nightmare on Elm Street 1 the best. I liked Nightmare on 1 and Wes Craven's new Nightmare the best. Because it was serious. Yeah. I didn't like it so much. I know a lot of people liked it when he did, but I didn't like it so much when Freddie turned into a comedian. Uh -oh. There is Heather Langenkamp right now. So I'll be talking to you and Stalin until Tiffany gets out of the phone here right away. <laughs> wonder what we're going to say. Everybody get ready because ask questions in the chat room and we'll pass them on Heather and see if we can get her to answer. Are we talking to her now? You can hear her in the background talking. Hey, Heather. Okay, I'll tell you what, we're going to go on right away. Okay? Are you ready? The other host, Terry or Tracy? Uh, it's Terry. Terry. There you go, you're on. Are you related? Uh, yes, he's my dad. Okay, okay here we go. Okay. Heather Heather Lagenkamp right here on yeah. Cult Radio Go Go. How are you doing today, Heather? I'm great. How are you today, Tim? <laughs> I'm good. Thanks so much for being on the show. We're so excited to have you on the show with us. It's my pleasure. Oh, my goodness. You do not know. When everybody thinks of Nightmare on Elm Street, you're the first face that comes into their head. Oh, well, thank you. I'm flattered by that. <laughs> I'm really lucky to to hold that image in people's heads. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to ask, because the original, the very first Nightmare, which was the one that started it all, that came out in, you know, way back in the 80s, 1984. Do you get tired of hearing about it? Because I know that you've done a lot of stuff, you've had a long career, but it's got to be the one thing that everybody asks you about. Yeah, you know, because it's my favorite project, I think, I've worked on um, in my career, I'm, I'm always really excited that people still, you know, have such high regard for it, and it's always kind of surprising to me that even after 25 years that it it's so important to people, and, and when I, for once in a while I'll go and, and do a convention or I'll be someplace where there'll be lots of fans, and it seems to me that just new generations <laughs> keep being born that keep watching Nightmare on Elm Street, so I'm constantly surprised at how many kids um, have seen the film, even though they never saw it in a movie theater. Right, right. And now you were you were fairly young when you did Nightmare, right? Yeah, you know, I think I had my 18th birthday on the set of. <laughs> I think I was 18 or 19, and um, it was really my first big, you know, big Hollywood movie kind of experience. Um, and we worked in Hollywood on a sound stage, right in the heart of Hollywood. So mm -hmm. it was very exciting and. Um, it was a pretty run-down place, actually. It was the old um, Desi Lu Studios, so it hadn't been worked on in you know 30 or 40 years. It was completely <laughs> just cobwebs. <laughs> it was really run down, but you know, obviously, the price was right for the producers, and so we we kind of took this old, you know, dilapidated studio over, and then of course we also shot on the lots of locations around Los Angeles. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's very few movies anymore that are really made in L.A. anymore. It, it, you know, it's quite expensive to shoot here. And, and so the other cool thing about it is that it was just, it's a completely L.A. movie, you know. It's right. all those locations you can still go by today. Now, the, the Elm Street house is actually a location in L.A., right? Yeah, it's up in Hollywood off of Sunset, and I hear that they're actually remodeling it and pretty much cha changing it, and it's very sad. And one guy came up to me recently with this door frame, literally. I mean, he had he swore that it was the door frame from the house, and <laughs> I don't know, I kind of looked at it. It didn't quite look the same <laughs> to me, but, you know, people are just upset with getting a part of that house, so I'm sure the owners wanted to do everything they could to change its facade because, you know, now there's just, you know, probably a million fans who try to go and take a shutter off of the house or, right. you know, go and take a blade of grass or something. So. Right. Now, with this being kind of the first, you know, big, as you were saying, big Hollywood production that you had done, tell us, how did it come about? How did you get the role of Nancy? Did you just go to an open call, or, or how did it all happen? You know, um, I was, I guess my career started in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was, uh, I was in Tulsa working there at a newspaper. My, my dad lived in Tulsa and so I was just kind of being like any other, you know, 17 year old kid and Francis Ford Coppola was making, um, two films in Tulsa that summer. One was The Outsiders and one was Rumblefish and I had gone, um, just to an open casting call that summer to be in one of those movies and just be an extra. So mm -hmm. I I had uh, been an extra in The Outsiders, and then 
when Rumblefish came along, I actually got a small speaking role in that movie, and I got my SAG card. So um, after that movie was done, you know, I didn't really think anything of it, and I went to college. I um, was I got into Stanford, and so I went to school, and I was starting, you know, my freshman year, and everything was great. And then um, I kept a relationship going with some of the people that I had met back in Tulsa who were now in L.A., and they said, come down, come down, we'll get you an audition. And this is a really wonderful woman named Janet Hershenson, who um, is a big casting director here in L.A. And she's like, come down, I, I want to, you know, put you up for a couple of parts, and I'll be your manager. And so I did that, and I and I got a really small independent movie called Nickel Mountain that was just a tiny, tiny little movie. I mean, I think they made it for $10. And <laughs> um, so I, I left school for, I think, about 12 weeks and made that movie. And then um, the same manager of mine sent me up for Nightmare on Elm Street. Later that summer, I think, or gosh, I can't remember the timeline really well, but um, it was just a regular audition. There were tons and tons of teenagers there. I know, um, you know, Charlie Sheen was there, and, you know, everybody in town was auditioning for this movie. Right. And um, so it was, you know, I never expected to get it, and plus it was a horror movie, and at that time they were really rare. I mean, they just, you didn't read for them that often, and I'm not sure I knew what the director, Wes Craven, was going to be looking for, so I just played it completely normal, like it was going to be a TV movie of the week, where you just play, you know, strong, independent teenager, you know, and I I just decided not to to play up to any of the campiness of some of the horror movies that, you know, had been out by then, and certainly the B-movies of the 60s and 70s, I just... I decided to kind of reject that style, and um, so I played it just like I would play it myself as a, you know, if I was reading for any other kind of part. And I'm trying to think of some of the other parts in those days. We were reading for things like, oh, Sixteen Candles and uh, The Breakfast Club, and the whole um, Brat Pack was really big back then. So everyone was playing everything really natural and teenagery and right. so that's kind of how we all were you know we we're aspiring to be in that school of acting and I guess Wes Craven liked it so I got the part in um it was really shocking but uh, you know I didn't know what to expect and it wasn't a huge budget by any stretch of the imagination and and everything was done you know all of our wardrobe came from Salvation Army and <laughs> It was pretty low budget as well, but the fact that we were in Hollywood at a soundstage made it feel really, you know, kind of glamorous. Well, I think that's probably part of the charm of Nightmare One. I know that Nightmare One was touted as being the movie that rejuvenated the horror genre at that time and started the whole slasher craze, and then it just went nuts from there. And a lot of the fans have said, because Nightmare One was more serious, and then as it went on, Freddy got funnier and funnier, and it got campier and campier. How do you kind of feel about that? Do you think that it, that Nightmare One was better because it was taken more as like a straight-on serious playing, you know, kind of horror film, or do you think it was better when it started being campy and funny and goofy? Well, you know, it's funny because some of the scenes that I, I see little clips shows with all of Freddy's gags, and some of them towards the end did get to be pretty ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I have to, like there was one with Freddy dressed up, you know, in a chef's outfit with a chef's toque right. on, you know, and he's, <laughs> I forget what the line is, but, you know, I I do think that got a little ridiculous, and um, in, in the, I guess, in the interest of seeing the franchise continue, you know, making people laugh is always a great way of bringing people to the theater, so I can see why they took that turn, but whenever you look at the first movie in the series, they all, they are more serious, I mean, it was a serious film there wasn't anything funny about it i mean when uh when i go and see it and people laugh at certain parts it's usually you know they they see ronnie uh, blakely drinking in the hallway and you know those kinds of moments are a little bit comic and some of the uh you know some of the effects are a little comic in just the way they're executed but in general 
I don't think Wes Craven was trying to make anybody laugh with Freddie's personality or at that point. And then, um, you know, the, the kids, as they kind of, the movies went along, I mean, the kids just started kind of walking into some of these Freddie gags and... Mm-hmm. They were just such setups with punchlines. It was very much like a sitcom, you know, the kind of humor that people really enjoy. And, yeah, I don't think I care for it as much, but I certainly see why they were popular. Right, right. Now, obviously, I know that there's there's two actors from one of them that was already big and big in horror films and another one that became a huge actor that you have to always be asked about. So let's just get it out of the way. <laughs> what was it like working with Johnny Depp? You know, it was really great, and um, one of the reasons it was great is because he was less experienced than I was at acting <laughs> at that moment. So, I so you taught him done, everything like, a, he knows, right, like, Heather? I had done a movie of the week and this low-budget independent film, and he had done nothing. So in that respect, it gave me a little bit of confidence thinking like, okay, I know I don't know much about this industry yet and I'm not the most accomplished actor yet but you know I'm like I looked over at Johnny and some days I just felt so lucky that at least I had had an opportunity to work in the film business you know before because there was a lot of pressure on you and you and you feel very responsible for you know really pulling off what they're what they're asking you to pull off and it's very hard to do a horror movie and and you know Johnny bless his heart I mean I think he I think he and I both were just feeling like such newcomers and we were just really happy when the movie was over (laughs) I think we're like phew we dodged that bullet you know and then the movie was uh, you know kind of successful in the movie theaters it wasn't I always like remember I went into my agent's office I don't know a month or two after the movie had come out and they still hadn't seen it, and, you know, I was, I was like, you know, when are you going to go see Nightmare on Elm Street? I mean, it's a really good movie, and they're like, oh, we will, you know, we promise, and I would think back, like, I don't know if there's an actor today who, if their agents told them they hadn't seen the movie, wouldn't have fired him on the yeah. spot, you know, <laughs> but it was just not that big of a deal, and and it didn't have much um, pull in the industry back then, so, you know, I, I kind of just went back to doing movies of the week and I did uh, you know I just did whatever job I could get but certainly it wasn't the kind of job that opens billions of doors for you I right. wish it had been and and, uh, and even with Johnny too you know the, he I remember seeing him on the street a couple times and we're just like God you know how, how are you doing and, and he's like I'm doing okay and I'm like yeah I'm doing okay but Really, it was much later um, for when he did 21 Jump Street when he became like a huge superstar. Right. And, and we saw each other a couple of times between that, those, you know, two, that was about a five-year period of time. And, you know, there was a lot of struggling going on. I, I wish sometimes that that movie had been made today because I think it would have made a big difference, actually, in, in some of the ways that my career went later on. Mm-hmm. And what about the other one I'm sure that everybody asks about? What about who at the time was a pretty, you know, established cult star at the time, Robert England? Well, he he was. He was definitely um, a, a godsend to that film and to me and I think to everybody. He, he has a way of, um, well, first of all, he has a way of, of being a mentor where it's not, like a lot of older actors, like, put their arm around you and kind of pat you on the back and they 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 put this big space between you like I know so much more than you and someday you'll be as knowledgeable as I and right but Robert really wanted to be a kid and so he did everything he could to just get into the, the kind of frame of mind that we were in and he was so um, into the art scene here in L.A., and he knew everybody, and he was so exciting to be around that um, he offered a lot of guidance in a way that just made you want to just keep on listening to him all the time and, and, and take his advice. And and then, you know, there's actually at the time, um, John Saxon was really the um, superstar on our set. In fact, mm-hmm. it was John Saxon who, by putting his name 
to the film, got the film made. They they were able to raise the money when John Saxon said he would be in it. And he was a huge, huge star. And that um, back then for the karate films that he was in, but he's always... He was a part of the old Hollywood system where he, you know, had a contract with Paramount, I think, and, you know, he acted in just dozens and dozens of movies, and if you ask, if you ask a woman who's about 65 now about John (laughs) Sackle, it's like, his day and age is Johnny Depp, I mean, he was so sexy, and he was always this very macho, great character actor who did, you know, he was uh, incredibly, uh, I mean, his body was just to die for. So everyone that I mentioned John Saxon to was like, oh, my God, you're, you're acting in a movie with John <laughs> <laughs> So you had Robert, who was kind of an up-and-coming younger actor, you know, in his 30s, and mm-hmm. then John was probably in his early 50s, maybe. Right. Uh, maybe not that old yet. And um, so we had all ranges of people on that set. And then Ronnie Blakely... Um, you know, she had been nominated for an Academy Award, and so we had this fantastic cast, and Amanda Wiss was uh, a really, you know, she was probably the most working actor of all of us. She just did so many movies, and she was everywhere on the screen and on the TV back then, and so Johnny and I were completely just the total newcomers, and so <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty intimidating. Well, one of the ensemble casts to start out with. <laughs> yeah, it was a great, I mean, when you really break it apart and look back now, and actually I just saw the movie about a month ago in Chicago. I did a convention, and we all sat outside. They got a big screen, and we watched it outside, and one of the performances that I really loved the most was actually Nick Corey's performance, and it is so good and um and you just remember you know gosh you know he's such a fine actor and and he too was pretty much of a newcomer back then too right now now you're a mom right yeah okay so now first of all are you yourself either now or before you did the nightmare films you also have done some other horror films like you did shocker with Wes craven as well yeah, you know, that that was a situation. Actually, I met my husband through um, Wes Craven. My husband is a really prominent special effects makeup artist, and um, he had done um, Serpent in the Rainbow with Wes in Haiti, and it was a really it was one of those film shoots where everyone becomes best friends for life because it's so gnarly. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so much was going on, and the voodoo, and the... It just the shooting conditions were really tough, and the people and the revolution was going on then, and it was one of those really intense movie making experiences. And when um, they got back from Haiti, um, several of the people who worked on that film introduced me to my husband. It was Wes, but also his assistant and his producer. They all were like, "You need to meet David Anderson." So um, it was through Wes that I met my husband David, and. Um, David worked on Shocker with Wes. That was one of his next films. So um, one night I just happened to be on the set and they needed a dead body and that was me. <laughs> I, I'm not, I wouldn't really count myself in Shocker. I just, I'm like a dead body that gets wheeled out of a house. <laughs> well, what I was getting at is are you either now because of your involvement in the genre or were you a horror movie fan? You know, I've never been a huge fan. I'm way more of a fan now than I was. You know, surprisingly, that's the answer that we get from a lot of people that are in the movies. They're like, no, I don't watch them. (laughs) You have to realize, like, when I was growing up, I don't even remember what horror movies were out. I mean, I went to go see Burnt Offerings with Karen Black, which is my favorite movie because it's, like, the only horror movie that I saw as a kid. And Mm -hmm. then, of course, I've seen scary movies, but, you know, a lot of them I just... I must have just blanked them out because they just didn't make a big impression on me. Right. And then once I got involved in working on horror movies, I always felt like, oh, you know, been there, done that. I just don't need to go see any more gore. And right. then when after meeting David, my husband, you know, watching him work on horror movies is really what got me to be a fan because I saw how all the gore and all of the gags and all of the special effects were done and so I became really interested in it that way and you know I I mean I don't I don't know if you're married but it's 
you know, all along the way, my husband and I were like, okay, you've got this job here, and either I can go with you and we'll work with you and we'll do this together, or I'll stay home in L.A. and try to get an acting job while you're over in London doing Alien. Right. <laughs> so uh, all along the way, we made these choices, and most, you know, a lot of them in the last 15 years have been to go do what he's doing because he has been doing some fantastic projects. So slowly I've become his partner, and now we do the effects for movies together. And uh, oh, wow. it kind of started with, um, well, it really started with Dawn of the Dead. We, we did that together in Canada, and I was the shop coordinator, and he, you know, is the designer. So we did all those zombies, I don't know, 350 zombies that were just incredible to make. We made some really fantastic zombies. And then, um, you know, we've done some other horror movies. We just did one called Asylum, mm -hmm. which is directed by David Ellis, who did Snakes on a Plane. And I think it's going to come out any day now. I mean, it seems like it should be out in the next month or two at least. Maybe it's going to be Halloween. But it's um, about kids going back to college, and there's a haunted dormitory that is um, the, the bad guy is this really deranged doctor who kills you with lobotomy picks. So <laughs> that's called asy the Asylum, I think. And we did that last year, and uh, we made all the puppets and things for Dead Silence. Oh, so wow. We, we love Dead Silence. <laughs> I know. I lo well, so we good. love Yay. making those puppets. Because um, you can't get creepier than puppets. Puppets are really creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Super creepy. So now, I mean, now, like, we... Um, you know, we make a lot of these scary movie gags and stuff, exploding heads and brains that spill out. And and so I enjoy horror movies. I'm totally looking at that now. Right. I'm looking at the, I'm looking at how creative the gore is. I'm looking at how the heck did they figure out how to do that and and the camera work and how the director is. It like, kind of makes you look at them a little stuff. different, yeah. So, but I, I mean, I, I'm working on some projects to act again and um, I'm really hoping that a couple of them come through. Um, one is a, well both of them actually are kind of horror movies. One is um, you know about these people kind of trapped in the woods and that's always scary. And right. then another one is about a small town that has a you know a vengeful ghost that is uh, kind of destroying a family line of you know bloodline and so both of these scripts are dynamite, and I've attached myself to both of them, but it just, whether they get made, you know, I'm hoping and keeping my fingers crossed. Any chance that we can get a, a clue as to what they're called? Because I know all the fans out there are waiting to see what your next project's going to be. Okay. They changed their name recently. Um, I've got to think. Um, oh, darn. My, oh, my gosh. It'll come to me in a minute. A minute. Okay. It has a one-word name, like, Primal. I think that's what it's called, Primal. Oh, okay. And um, the other one is called Nemesis. Mm. So both of them have one word names. We'll see. Well, one we were also wondering because, and you know, sometimes the Internet's wrong. I don't know. You'll have to let us know. But over on Internet Movie Database, it says right now that you're involved in two projects. One is called The Bet, where you actually play yourself. Well, that is a movie I did for a friend of mine in, from Italy. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a... Uh, it was a short film, and I did play myself in it. But I don't think anyone in America will see it. I think, I think it's like in Italy somewhere. Okay. And the other film that they have mentioned is Pigman Road. Yeah, that's the one that's called Primal. That just got renamed. Okay. <laughs> that one's called Primal now. And actually, the um, you know, all the cast is set up to go. I think literally as soon as they get some money, it's going to start and. It's going to be a really scary movie, I think. So I, I'm looking forward to it. And um, I hear the new Halloween, D. Wallace is in it, mm -hmm. apparently is just incredible. I'm hoping that I can kind of pull a D. Wallace and come out from obscurity and take over a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all of your fans, Heather. You never left. So you don't have to oh, worry that's about that. Sweet. <laughs> you know with DVDs these days? It, yeah. it is like you never leave. It is. People just don't realize, like, you haven't worked in, you know, five years. But 
you know, to them, they don't know the difference. Yeah, exactly. Now, you did Nightmare 1, and then you came back for Nightmare 3. And then after that, you didn't do any of the Nightmare films until they did Wes Craven's new Nightmare. What was it like to kind of reunite with everybody and do that? Well, I think that it it was really, um, it was all due to Wes, of course, because he just came up with that idea to bring the movie into the real world and have a new kind of, add a new dimension to the whole story. And I don't think they could have made another Freddy movie any other way. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, they made Freddy vs. Jason, but... um, that was kind of in its own dimension. <laughs> um, but, you know, Wes, I think, came up with this great idea, and, of course, New Line was really eager to do it, and I really was flattered, because it, when a director puts you in three scripts in a row, because Wes had done the script for Nightmare 3, mm-hmm. um, it means that they think a great deal of your work. And, right. And I think... Of all the things I'm proudest of, it's it's probably that, that there's a director out there in the world who really believed in me and thought that I did a great job. And uh, that's that's all you can really ask for, in, no matter what your job is, is that, you know, your colleagues think highly of your of your work. So right. um, that movie, just every day, was a complete and utter joy. I mean, it was so much fun to work with Wes again. And... My wardrobe was so much better. <laughs> oh, you didn't like the eighties wardrobe, Heather. I did not. It wasn't even eighties. It was like it was wardrobe from hell. And um it was so ugly. So when Wes I told Wes, I'm like, Can I look pretty in this? So we, anyway we had I had pretty clothes and I had a great makeup artist and great hair stylist and I just felt so glamorous and I just think the movie turned out so well and plus I got to play a mom which I just really identify with the the whole being a mom and I hope that as my career continues I I have a chance to play moms more often because a lot of times they make moms like these ridiculous characters who either just have no sense or you know it's kind of a foil for the kid to insult all the time or, right. or fight with or and you know, there's once in a while movies come along where the mother is truly heroic and, you know, is is battling off all this danger and saving her children. And it's pre- pretty rare for that character in American cinema. I mean, right. And I just feel like I got to play such a great mother's role that, that time. And, and I just love the movie. And it's really hard for me to decide which one I like more. It was really an interesting concept at the time. Nobody had really done, you know, it, the slasher movies have always been the slasher movies. It's never been about about making a, a movie about making a movie. Um, as far as the little boy that played your son in that film, was I take it that wasn't your, your, your son that was no, an actor? No, it wasn't my son. That was a boy named Miko Hughes. Mm-hmm. And um, ironically, my hus- when I first met my husband, um, he was working on uh, Pet Cemetery, mm-hmm. and that little boy, Nico, was the little boy in Pet Cemetery. And my husband and I were like, "Wow, he's scary good." I mean, yeah, he's yeah. really, you know, he's always looked younger than his his real age. So when he was five or six, he was playing three, you know, and that's at Pet Cemetery. He was he was probably four or five when he was playing that little kind of tiny child. And then same in my movie, um, Nightmare 7, he was, I think he was 10 or 11, but he was playing 6 or 7, you right. know. So he's already, like, uh, he's a very smart little boy, and, and he'd been in the movie business way longer than me, I think, at that time. So he's very experienced, and um, he was just so good and darling, and we got along just great. And his... um you know, I'm not really sure where his career has taken him now, but, gosh, I'd really love to see him again someday. We'd have some good times to catch up on. Now, we had interviewed Robert, because uh, the co-host of the show, Terry, he actually is a writer for many national horror magazines. Oh, nice. And he had interviewed Robert around the time of Wes Craven's New Nightmare, and Robert, had, who's just a sweetheart, um, had told us, some stories about some mishaps and things on set. I mean, obviously, you're, when you're working with a glove that's knives, there can yeah. be accidents. Was there ever anything that had happened while you were on set filming? Well, you know, um, 
in the first nightmare, um, well, you know, those gloves are really scary, and we, there were several sets of them. There were sharp ones, there were dull ones, there were plastic ones, there were stunt ones. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was always ex- extremely careful that the right set was on his hand, <laughs> you know, swiping right. at my face or fighting with me. But, um, you know, Robert reminded me of a couple of of fights that we had where, you know, I get totally clocked, you know, just, you know, you're trying to choreograph everything, but you just don't always do a great job. Mm -hmm. um, Other scenes where, um, you know, I'm running down the alleyway and I cut my foot open, things like that happen pretty frequently, not frequently, but enough that you remember them. And, but, in terms of bad mishaps, I think we're pretty blessed that nothing really bad happened. But, um, you know, I never was very fond in Nightmare 7 of that scene with the big snake and the big tongues wrapping around my face <laughs> and, and all the fire and everything. It was just kind of scary. And um, one time we were fighting with these eels, and I have to grab an eel and poke out Robert's eye with it, and it was just nasty. And so there's a lot of nastiness, but... I never really felt like it was dangerous. Right. Now, we have a chat room that's going on um, for listeners of the station while we're doing the show. And we have some listeners in there that were wanting to know if there's any plans on you doing any projects with Robert. Not necessarily nightmare films, but anything with Robert to where we'll be able to see you guys together again. Well, I hope so. Robert's making a lot of movies overseas now. And, um, you know, he he gets a lot of... He gets a lot of roles, you know, to play scary characters and stuff. So I'm hoping that someday I would have a chance to act against him, um, you know, in something. I know this movie um, that slated this movie Nemesis I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I know that I've asked Robert to look at one of the parts in that um, movie um, to see if he might be interested in playing it because I think he would he wouldn't be wearing any makeup or anything he would be playing it straight but right. it's this uh, it's this kind of a, the mayor a corrupt kind of mayor of this town I think he would be perfect for it so um, I've been kind of begging him to, to get interested in it and maybe do it but I'm hoping maybe one of the projects that Robert directs that maybe he might ask me to be in one. yeah that'd be I'm great I, I've, I've dropped a couple of hints well, Robert, if you're listening. Yeah, Robert. <laughs> and then one other project that you did that wasn't necessarily horror, but I don't know, some people could say it was. It was. <laughs> and that was the uh, Tanya, Tanya and Nancy, the inside okay, story. Okay, that was true horror in real life. <laughs> <laughs> because that girl, Tanya Harding, was truly scary. Yes. <laughs> I mean... But the funny thing is, is that when we were making Nightmare 7, because I had the long brown hair and everything, and on the front page of all the tabloids was Nancy Kerrigan. Right. And as a joke, the producer would hang them up in the makeup trailer just to, like, I don't know, make me feel self-conscious or whatever. Like, you look just like Nancy Kerrigan. And um, so we had this joke about it. And then the producer, um, Marianne, came up to me. She's like, I'm serious. You really need to go try to get a part in the new Nancy Tanya movie of the week. And I said, you're kidding. They're making a movie about this already? I mean, literally, it was still on the front page of, you know, the right. choir. I said, how can they put together a movie that fast? And she's like, my friend's doing it, and you need to go over there and show your face and get that part. So I, I called up the casting director, and um, I said, you know, People tell me I look like Nancy Kerrigan, and I would like to come in. Because I didn't have an agent at this moment. I don't know why I didn't have an agent, <laughs> but so I just like, I'll just call myself. Right. And um, so she's like, oh, yeah, come on over. And so I came over, and I was all dressed like Nancy Kerrigan. And she's like, wow, you're right. And and so then I got the part. I just, I guess they wanted someone who looked a lot like her. And then, thank goodness, my mom had made me take ice skating lessons. Oh, about see? a year and a half when I was about four. <laughs> so I could do, like, some very basic ice skating. And a wonderful girl named Tracy, I wish I could remember her last name, she was my double and my trainer. And so she did all those fantastic leaps and everything. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, put on the stupid costume, and they 
shushed me around the eyes on a platform and made me look like I was skating. <laughs> now, what was it like working with Al- Alexander Powers, who played Tanya? Did you guys get along in real oh, life? Yes, or? of course. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> wanted it was to make hilarious. sure there was no whacking on the set that was real. Yeah, yeah so. well, it was. It was totally real, but it was with like a little fake baton. And um, <laughs> my son came to the set with me that day, and. Um, I was having trouble with child care at the time, I remember, and I had to take him to work a couple of days. And, right. Um, so I take him to work, and and they do that scene, and he starts reenacting it for me when we get home, and I'm like, oh, this is really terrible. And uh, he started that, that one scene where um, she falls to the ground, and she says, why? You know, why? And my son would, like, whack me on the knee with a spoon, and then I would fall to the floor and go, why? <laughs> It was a really, it was hilarious. And the thing is, is that I actually liked Alexandra so, I mean, I liked her performance so much because I really liked her way better than Nancy Kerrigan by the end of that movie. And, and you know, I, I mean, I hate to say this, and Nancy Kerrigan is a lovely person, but for some reason she just never caught the sympathy of America as much right. as people kind of enjoyed the Tanya part of the drama Mm -hmm. and and so in a way I felt that my part was a little bit stiff and boring because as a human being at the time she was portrayed as this you know ice queen and right and and so it wasn't as juicy or enjoyable a part to play I don't think right now I take it obviously since the story you just told us that your kids are fully aware of what mom does yeah they totally well I mean in the past you know I I worked a lot more, and so I would take them with me to work, and, um, you know, they would be much more involved. But in the past few years, I mean, now that I, we have a shop where we make our special effects makeup, they much more see me as that person who goes to work and, you know, does the bookkeeping. <laughs> so, and I'm glad it's that way. I mean, kids, they really, I mean, having known a lot of kids a very prominent actors or directors or whatever, you know, when kids are teenagers, I think if their parents are too big and glamorous or whatever, they have a hard time kind of understanding what their role in life is going to be or what what their place is going to be if they just want to do what they want to do, and they feel pressure to to perform and achieve at levels that might not be that realistic for a teenager, so... um, I'm kind of glad I've been able to lay low because I I do feel my kids have really benefited from just me being totally normal as much right. as possible. Right. Now I know you got to get going, but real quick before you go, just just as like a final question, a lot of ev- a lot of people that were growing up early '90s remember you from just the ten of us. Yes. <laughs> what Wasn't was it like the working on? It was so fun. Can't we just get that on Nickelodeon? You know what I'm saying? I'm surprised it's not on Nick at Night or T V Land or something like that. I mean, especially now people it would be ten times funnier now. Yeah. Because kids just don't even behave like we behaved at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's kinda like watching Three's Company. Now. Exactly. You, know, you just can't <laughs> help but laugh. Um well if if anybody wants to know like what the most perfect job in Hollywood is, I think it might be being the part of a large ensemble comedy cast mm-hmm. on a TV show on a major network. I mean, it's such a great job, and um, you get to go to work every day and work with funny people who who just their main job is to make people laugh. It's such a great, great. Time. Right. And, um, of course, we really got along. All the girls, um, well, the young women, they were most of them young women, we just had so much fun, and, and the producers were hilarious, and the writers were all hilarious. And it was too bad it ended as quick as it did. We only did about 50 episodes. Right. And um, we were kind of the victim, not the victim, but it just, there was a huge sea change in sitcoms right then, because Roseanne came out. Mm-hmm. And once Roseanne and Married with Children came out, it's like the old style sitcoms just, they just had to kind of go by the wayside. And right. everything got really edgy and really kind of, I don't know, just down and dirty and yeah, funny. Yeah, kind of gritty, but, yeah. But that whole Brady Bunch model just had to go out the window. And we tried to kind of get there in our own way, 
but there was a lot of, um, you know, even within the network at that time, I think there was a lot of ambivalence of, like, do we go Roseanne and go really hard and edgy and crass, or do we stay, like, happy Brady Bunch, family ties, you know, all those old 80s, um, that 80s model of the family sitcom. And I think we were a victim of just they didn't really know which way to go. And I, we were pretty popular, though. I'm, I look at the numbers that we had back then, and gosh, I mean, any sitcom right now would kill for our numbers. Because <laughs> there were so few shows on. Right, you know? right. There wasn't much to choose from. Well, I want to thank you so much for being on the show, Heather. Is there any kind of a, do you have like a main website or something where people can go and keep updated on you your? You know what? I, you know what? I used to have a website and then it got kind of absconded. Somebody, I don't know, something happened to it. it oh, no. It taken over by a, a strange well, there's plenty internet of fans presence. that would be willing to set one up for you. <laughs> well, I don't really? Know. Well, I, it's been on my to-do list, and now with Facebook and everything and, um, you know, MySpace, one of my thoughts is that I do, like, a MySpace kind of page and try to try to communicate and blog and, and be a, a presence on it uh, rather than just, like, a space for people to, you know, put a posting. Right. So, um, I, think I, I think I'll probably go that way, and it'll probably be, like, Heather Lang and Camp. Um, on MySpace. Okay. Well, and definitely let us know because everybody's wanting, everybody's on MySpace. Everybody wants to add you as a friend. So. I'll try to add everybody as a friend. And what I need to do is be disciplined about doing it <laughs> every day or every five, fifth day or, you know, and it's, I mean, life is so busy. Yeah. I can't believe it. Yeah. Um, but school's starting on Wednesday for us, so I am so excited. I'm going to have so much free time, and so this will be a really good opportunity to start something and communicate with my fans. But, you know, I love hearing what people have to say. I, I don't, you know, I, um, I, I really, I just have to say thank you to all the people who have come up to me or written me or, you know, whatever that way they communicate with me because... It's. Um, I'm always listening and and amazed at how that movie affected people. Definitely. Any any word on another appearance or convention that you're going to be doing? Um. Yeah. You know. I know. I'm doing one in Texas. Um. No. Is it Texas next March? I think. Mm -hmm. And so that's the next one that I'm planning on doing. I believe it's in Texas. I. Um, I try only to do maybe one a year because otherwise, I don't know. I get. I get too burned out, but right. um, they're they're a lot of fun. I went to Fangoria. Um, I guess it was in June, and then I I did one in Chicago in July, and that was amazing. Um, and so I'll try Texas, and, and we'll see what else comes up. I I try not to say no. It just usually my schedule right. is, um, is really tight. Okay. Well, we want to thank you so much for being on the air, Heather. Well, thank you, Tiffany, and. Good luck with your show. It's Thank awesome. You. <laughs> you guys are great, and you're keeping you're keeping the I don't know the spirit alive. The spirit alive. <laughs> and, um, I'll let you know if anything happens with either of my two movies, and I'll come back. Absolutely, come back. Talk about the movies when they're ready to come out, and then we can let everybody know. Hopefully, by then you'll be on MySpace. You'll be going. There you go. <laughs> All Thank right. you guys. Thank you, Heather. Take care. You too. Bye. -bye. Bye.